Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to another ChrisMartinson.com podcast. I am your host, of course, Chris Martinson, and today we have the pleasure of welcoming back to our program Paul Tustain, founder of Bullion Vault and editor of Galmarly.com. Paul is one of the foremost experts on precious metals, and I've invited him to share his latest perspective with us at a confusing time for investors. Gold and silver remain volatile, and they've been largely range-bound over the past year. The evidence for price manipulation appears to grow each month, but results in no real action on the behalf of regulators. No surprise there, of course. Add to this the more hawkish statements released by the Fed yesterday, plus Bernanke's recent trash talk tour against the gold standard, What's a precious metals investor to think? Paul, I'm glad you're joining us again to help make sense of all this. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for asking me, Chris. Well, let's get right to it then. Um, what's happening with precious metals right now? Are we in a prolonged consolidation phase? I'm looking at my screen. I'm seeing a lot of red today uh, for both gold and silver at this exact moment. Uh, has there been a change in the fundamentals that we need to be aware of here, or is something else going on? Your views. No, I don't think there's been a, a great change in the fundamentals. I think we know pretty much what's going on. Uh, we have ongoing quantitative easing. It may or may not come again. The markets get bored of doom and gloom. People get bored of it. We had a belly full of it uh, over the back end of last year. Uh, certainly the economic data out of the U.S. is better than it was. Um, that's happening against a backdrop of still extremely loose monetary policy. So um, uh, we're in a world where, you know, uh, the, the, the Europeans have given an almighty kick um, of the can down the road, the one trillion euro reflation effectively of the European banking system. Um, that will come back to haunt us in a big way um, before long. They're all already starting to worry again about Spain. Um, certainly in a year or 18 months, we'll have to have a long, hard look at Italy again. Uh, by then, it'll only be 18 months until all that money has to be paid back again. In the meantime, we're looking at a banking sector. It's got all the same problems as before, but markets do this. They have a certain rhythm. Um, uh, I, I don't think the fundamentals have changed. I certainly don't think anything has been fixed. Um, sometimes you have to be patient. Um, I'm probably of that school. I'm not looking at the charts every five minutes and worrying about whether the price is going up or down. For example, yesterday, I and mean, they're certainly quite thin markets. Ben Bernanke, or it's the, the publication of the minutes from um, from the U.S. Fed, uh, which took the market sharply lower. Um, that's a symptom of a thin market more than anything else. Um, it's not an exciting story right now. Yeah, I noticed that uh, the Globex session seems to be a popular place, that thinly traded session in between uh, when New York Comics closes and we're waiting for other things to open up. You've just got that the e-mini market open for business. It's, it's relatively thin. That seems to be a, a good place to see sharp moves like we saw yesterday after the Fed minutes were published there. Uh, and I will note, I just one thing I do have to um, raise here is that you know the U.S. is in relatively better shape, but only because the U.S. is deficit spending at a rate that we we would excoriate Greece for attempting, and certainly Spain's feet are being held to the fire for for uh, running a, a rate of deficit that's far lower than the U.S. So yes, the U.S. is showing some positive signs here and there, but I was expecting all of that and more, to be honest, given the absolute astonishing amount of of deficit spending. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I don't, that's what I mean. The fundamentals haven't changed. We're in a very loose monetary environment, and um, that doesn't mean anything has been fixed. It just looks better for a while, and, uh, and there's a sharp contrast with, as I said, with the European situation at the back end of last year. Well, we also have negative real interest rates, and I, I know that the Ben Bernanke is on record as saying the hope of those putting interest rates down so low is to change the risk profile and push people back out into the risk assets, because for whatever reason, that's where they want us all to hang out, uh, over there in stocks and whatnot. So, so uh, mission accomplished. We have extra risk, but we also have extra derivatives out there, extra deficit spending, negative real interest rates. These are all tailwinds to the price of gold to me. Uh, and one reason I too don't spend every five minutes checking the price of gold. I've I used to, but I've I've since uh, sort of settled into a, a view of acceptance of saying this will this will play out at some point, and uh, I think uh, uh, the appropriate levels will be found sooner or later. Now, do you believe that gold and silver prices are being manipulated, influenced, uh, coerced, nudged? 
whatever terms we prefer. I, I have a, a article I wrote recently where uh, I put out some very qualitative indirect evidence. Of course, direct evidence is lacking, but um, it seems to me that there's some oddities in the market that are difficult to explain. And of course, we have Bart Chilton uh, on record, uh, the uh, one of the CFTC um, council members talking openly about gold manipula silver manipulation. Sorry. And uh, and he's certainly got an insider's view. What's your take here? Well, there's uh, there's a whole load of questions built up because there's there are different flavors of um, the manipulation story. Uh, I think it's probably well known that I'm not really strongly in the manipulation camp, but I do agree that uh, market manipulation tends to happen in futures contracts. Uh, this isn't anything to do with gold or silver specifically. It's to do with the way futures contracts work. It's to do with the fact that they have a an expiry date. Um, as you approach that expiry date, if, for example, in the in the metals, you tend to find that there are lots of relatively small volume longs, and the the bigger banks will be short. The bigger banks have a huge um, tactical advantage over the longs here, because as a short, if you've got um, physical metal at the uh, at the futures depositories then you can just run your short to expiry and push some some metal across the floor to to the buyer if you don't have those settlement facilities you can't do that and of course the longs which are mostly private retail longs they don't have those settlement facilities they don't have those depository accounts they have to settle sorry they have to close so they'll they'll have to sell out the old contract at the desk and as likely as not, they'll end up buying the new contract that reopens. Um, generally speaking, the banks are taking probably something like a dollar an ounce out of that trade. It's not, it's not really a huge manipulation. What they're doing is they're sitting there, just as anybody would, knowing, knowing that they can settle. They'll sit there with their price bid in the market um, on the old contract, and they will leave it somewhere around 50 or 60 cents an ounce below the forward curve. They don't care if they get hit or not. If they get hit, they close off and they've bought their gold back uh, at 60 cents below the, uh, below the forward curve. And, uh, and if they're running, running to settlement, then they'll just shunt the gold off and buy another stock in the, in the forward markets to, to reload. So they are completely ambivalent about it and they've got the whip hand because they can settle. So I agree, and I think that's what Bart Chilton is talking about, uh, you'll tend to find that there's short-term manipulation that runs in the last week of the future, in the first week of the following future, when there is a tendency for the banks to hold the old one low and to uh, charge the new contract uh, uh, to, and to offer the new contract at a higher price. So that's, that's where I think there is a degree of manipulation. And as I say, that is a problem with futures markets. It doesn't exist in the forward markets because they settle every day. So the forward curve tends to be smooth all the way forward. Um, and, and, of course, you know, the, the, the banks can very easily, if they're taking stock on in the futures markets, then they will offload it in the forward market at, at right on the curve. They're very, they're both markets are very deep and very liquid, and so you end up with these positions on one side and on the other. They sort of balance each other out. And in any event, and this is what people don't sort of very often get, you can't manipulate a, mar mani manipulate a market for more than about a week or so um, by holding, for example, a short position on a futures contract. I feel I'm probably getting into dangerous territory here. I don't really mean to be controversial. It's just, it's just that it looks to me that futures markets are capable of being manipulated. Let's move on then to the next bit, which is uh, where I think you've written a very interesting article. And funnily enough, um, my head of research, Adrian Ash, noted the same phenomenon um, a couple of years ago. I know it's been discussed in various places, and there certainly is a data phenomenon that needs explaining, and you drew attention to that. Uh, it's absolutely right. Uh, if I can summarize the, uh, the phenomenon, it's that there are two daily auctions done in London. They're called the, the Gold Fix. Um, one is done at uh, 10.30 a.m. London time. One is done at uh, 3 p.m. London time. Um, what you've drawn attention to is the fact that the uh, morning fix is frequently, uh, to a statistically very significant degree, uh, is at a higher level than the afternoon fix. And this couldn't happen uh, by statistical accident. It's far too consistent a pattern. I completely agree with you. There 
there's a pattern there which needs an explanation. But I think there is a rational market explanation, and I don't think that um, market uh, manipulation by government is, in fact, it. I think it's much simpler than that. To understand what's going on, you need to have a basic understanding of how the fix works. And it's not a perfect market, but then what market is. You have five banks sitting around what amounts to a digital table in London. They have behind them many hundreds of clients who will have placed uh, limit orders into uh, the dealing books. And those five banks are going to try and come up with a with, a, with an auction price which clears all the purchasers and all the sellers at the same price. And that will be the fixed price. But each of those five banks, what, what you often find is the clients out there in the investment world are taken as a group. They're going to be buyers. In which case, to get the market into balance, the banks themselves will be sellers. And it could be the other way around. The clients that are out of the back could be sellers, in which case bringing the market into balance, the banks would be buyers. Now, the way it's done is they declare a price, uh, which is then thumped into the computer, and each of the five banks will declare whether they're buyers or sellers at that price. When it gets very close to being in balance and somebody picks up the difference and there'll be just a little a smidgen there and then the fix is declared and then all the buyers and all the sellers have agreed at the same price. But if you've got, let's say, 200 customers at the back who are on average buyers, then you've got a pretty good idea that the other five banks are also going to have a lot of buyers out there in the market because you've got a big statistical sample. If that's the case, it's very likely that today, taken as a group, those five banks who are trading this market on their own book, they're going to be acting as sellers because there's no other supply to come from. So the client demand is pushing the price up. And those five banks, when they declare their own position as sellers, they're not going to be dumb enough to declare themselves as sellers before the price has gone up a bit. Because they want to sell the price, they want a selling price for themselves, for their own gold, which is slightly above the spot price of three minutes ago. I hope this is making some sense. So the, 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 the banks uh, in, a, in a market full of buying clients will want a higher price. Now, the way, that, the way those buyers, they're playing basically an elegant game of spoof, because any one of those five banks can declare as the seller at that price, and is likely to be the bank that's got a little bit more gold as they go into the fix that will declare first. But they all have this interest, if they've got this big statistical pile of client buyers, all those sellers, those five banks, have an interest in not declaring too early. So the question is, when you look at the differential between the AM and the PM fix, is who's making money out of this? And of course, someone who's making money is somebody who's buying at the PM fix and who is selling at the AM fix. So that's, uh, and so that obviously you'd make money because you're buying at a, at a depressed afternoon price, selling at an at a elevated morning price. Now, next question, which will, I hope, make all this explanation clear as to what's going on. The reason the fix happens in London, apart from being historical, is because London is in touch with the eastern markets and the, and the western markets, eastern hemisphere, the western hemisphere. Now, if I ask you, which has been the general direction of the drift of gold over the last... 10 years, you would, I'm sure, guess right that the drift of gold has been from west to east. Uh, the Indians have been by far the, uh, consistently the world's biggest buyers, and the Chinese, of course, have joined them over the last uh, four or five years. So what that means is the banks want to sell, uh, or the banks are going to be selling on the thinner market, which is the AM6, before the USA has even woken up. And because they're selling to the Far Eastern markets on a consistent basis because the gold is moving east, the banks want higher fixes. So when they play their elegant game of spoof, presented with a whole load of buyers from their client sides, they're going to spoof for a higher price, by a dollar or whatever it is, uh, is every day. And when it gets back into sync in the afternoon, which is where the mines will be selling, where the supply of gold is coming from, the banks are now buying, there's a supply there. The world gets into balance in the, in the 24-hour period every time, but the drift goes from west to east. And the people who are in the powerful position, the market-making banks, they want to buy cheap in the afternoon and sell dear in the morning. So that, I think, is what's, 
is what's going on. It's interesting if you look at some data there, because there's a couple of things that back this up. India was a very, um, India was a, a very consistent importer of gold for a long time, um, but had a very, very quiet year in 2008. And if you look at the data for the difference between the AM and PM fix in 2008, you'll see there wasn't an awful lot of difference between the AM and PM fixes. Similarly, if you go all the way back to 1975, now that was when the U.S. started uh, to be uh, a U.S. people were allowed to buy gold again. And there was a big flow of gold into America in the mid-70s as the private ownership of gold was, was allowed again. Now, if you look at the data for the AM PM fix in that period, you see it switched around the other way. And the AM fix is then lower than the PM fix and to a much greater degree than you see it now. So you're, this uh, is a physical market for gold we're talking about, and these Asian buyers or Eastern buyers, um, including India in that statement, of course, our, our purchases are physical. So what you're talking about here is a, is a fairly sustained multi-year flow of gold from west to east. Is that right? That's right. I mean, last year, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure that I'm going to get the figures right off the top of my head, but I have a feeling that India and China in 2011 were acquirers of 700 tons and 900 tons of gold, respectively. Um, you typically see that the Shanghai market is running at a $1 or $2 premium over the AM fix. Uh, so it runs over, uh, sorry, over the spot market, and it runs at a premium. They're, they're acquiring physical gold. The AM and PM fixes are both the over-the-counter London market that's, um, that's, that's being dealt. So they can be and frequently will be settled with uh, good delivery bars, which are then shipped out of London. Quite a lot of them now are going London to Zurich and then being shipped off in kilo bars to the Far East. The kilo bars are a more popular um, uh, form of gold in the Far East. So, yes, there is a, there is a, a clear... I mean, the, the going rate for India, taken as a sort of 10-year average, is about 800 tonnes. Um, a year, and uh, 2008 was the, the flat year when they just suddenly stopped buying. Um, and the, the Chinese have been, as you know, steadily acquiring gold, um, not only uh, the state, but also in the last five years, private gold ownership has been liberated, has been uh, deregulated, and that's now all possible as well. So they're not only are they the biggest producers, but they're also the biggest consumers, so that they're a big net importer of gold in spite of the fact that they're the biggest producers of gold as well. Well, you know, Paul, something that confuses me is uh, this makes sense. The story makes sense. What confuses me is that um, the people from China and India that I know are extraordinarily good business people. Why wouldn't they just buy at the PM fix then? Well, um, interesting question. I mean, I think many of them. I think many of them do. I just don't think it's all of them. Um, why are there two fixes? I think that's quite a good question. I think probably what does happen is that a lot of them do buy at the PM fix. The PM fix is the much more liquid market because basically there's not much happening in the morning. In the morning, it's a small peripheral. It's it's you know the. Nobody gets very excited in the London market about the AM fix. The one they look at is the PM fix, and, they, and it's specifically bigger because the U.S. is a much, much bigger market. So if you like, the market which is out of whack, the market which is a statistical aberration, is the AM fix because it's at a, uh, if you like, a small unnatural premium to what it would be, and there's not that much happens at it anyway, so... Um, that's the way I look at it. I don't know if it's true. It just makes sense to me. And I would always rather look for a rational explanation than to sort of jump on the conspiracy thing, which, I mean, apart from anything else, if this were a way of trying to manipulate a market, it's singularly unsuccessful because anybody who's been selling gold in the afternoon has got to buy it back some stage. And one of the things that gets me about the market manipulation stories, and this is the thing I find most irritating about them as a sort of taken as a genre, is that the if you buy gold, if you bullion vault buys gold, we buy physical gold, um, we always take delivery, we ship it off to the vaults. We don't buy futures, we buy physical gold. Now, anyone sells gold to us, they've got to deliver us physical gold. Now, that's the same wherever you go. If somebody wants to buy real gold, the seller has got to provide them with physical gold. Otherwise, they start complaining about a settlement fail, and they get paid big settlement failure fees. If, 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 the, if the seller doesn't deliver, the buyer gets a settlement failure fee. Um, now, you don't hear about settlement fails. 
So what's really going on, what, what you always hear is that the, the conspiracy theorists are always saying, yes, but this is paper gold that's being sold. Look, you can't have it both ways. If it's paper gold that's being sold, then it's paper gold that's being bought. And there's a big double standard operating. If the people who sell paper gold are some sort of wicked, evil cartel, but the people who buy it are somehow some sort of saints. Um, and what's really going on here is a lot of the buyers are buying paper gold on futures markets. Uh, they don't have the money to pay for their gold. They think it's the sort of fair price discovery mechanism. But futures markets, taken as a whole, if you look at sort of um, if you look at them um, in this country, uh, futures brokers now have to warn their clients that 90% of people who participate in futures markets lose their money. And they lose it because the, the biggest problem they have is that every three months they are forced to liquidate and reopen by the nature of the futures market. And then, and the, particularly in gold, they're forced to exit at this depressed price because of this, this, this thing I was talking about earlier about the way a, a, a bullion bank will hold its futures prices down because it's in no hurry to buy back the contracts that it's short because it's perfectly happy to settle physical. Um, so I think, um, you know, I just think there's a, 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 the, the short answer is for any real gold that gets sold, real gold gets bought and delivered. And it's only, uh, on, the only paper gold that can be sold must be bought by people who want to buy paper gold. They're on, they're, 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 they're the same, they're, they're playing the same game. I don't think it's right or fair for the people who buy um, paper gold to think it's unfair that there are people who sell it to them. Well, you know, the futures market is something I've, I've dissected quite a few times because we noticed, um, uh, and it's very well known, that uh, certain ETFs that are meant to track certain physical substances like oil, like the USO ETF, badly lags the actual price of oil during a bull run. And the reason for that is because the pros front run the ETF. And, uh, you know, when the, when the ETF has to roll over its contracts, there are all the pros bidding up the price, making sure that the ETF has to pay a slightly higher price on the front end of that, right? Well, it's the same thing. There you are. Yep. It's exactly the same thing. So, so my belief in this is that um, anything that people can do to make a buck, they will, as long as they won't get thrown in jail for it. And even then, they might take the risk. So there's something... Yeah, but that, but, but... Okay, but that, there's, there's not something inherently, again, that's a, another asymmetry that you're describing, is if you can run a short till settlement. So if you're a big professional, you can go short the futures contract. If you've got the settlement facilities, whether it's in potatoes or pork bellies or oil or gold, if you're able to settle, you are and your position running to its expiry. The problem is for all the people at the small brokers paying the discounted brokerage fees whose terms of business say you cannot take delivery of this gold that you've bought. You have to settle for cash or you have to roll forward to the next to the next period. Right. And so then if we get back to Bart Chilton's statement, he's basically saying there's a structural issue in this market which allows certain players to have um, what we might call an unfair advantage. Uh, well, I think I, mean, I, I don't know the chapter and verse of what Bart Chilton has said. But it doesn't surprise me that uh, somebody who has very good knowledge of the futures market would see this um, potential for an uh, Is it an abuse? Um, what's happened is somebody who, somebody, the person who is sitting there bidding is bidding better than anybody else because nobody else is bidding for a contract at the death. Uh, is that, I mean, if it, should it be, is it against the rules? What's happened is that Private longs who are forced to sell out have got themselves into a hole by running to expiry. Uh, they, there is no liquidity in what they're doing. Um, it, it's, and in any event, you know, the, 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 the bigger player who can do the settlement, as I say, has got the whip hand. It just means it, it's something that doesn't happen in a, um, in a forward market or in a, in, a, in a spot settled market which settles every day. Um, and that, I think, is one of the big advantages of the way the non-futures markets, like, like for example, the, the London market, I think it's a big advantage of the way it's structured, because by and large, I mean, the, the, the players don't all settle, let's be clear, and we know that. Um, what many of them will do will close their trades before they reach settlement day, um, and they're perfectly entitled to do that, and that's happening in financial markets all over the world. But anybody who runs a trade to settlement day 
on the London market will set in bars. Okay. So this has been well known for a couple of years, this AMPM fi- fix difference. There's a large statistically relevant difference between those, those two moments. Uh, has, is, does that still exist today? Well, no, I don't think there's any evidence of it. I think uh, we looked at that quite recently, and there's, there's no um, real evidence of uh, a difference between the two this year. Interestingly, the um, Indians, they have a balance of payments problem, which is that there's so much gold going into India that there's currency exiting. So what they do, pretty much the same as I think we did in this country 30-odd years ago, they've put uh, a special duty on gold imports to suppress the rate at which they're sending all their dollars overseas. Well, um, since they did that, there's very little evidence of an AMPM um, differential in the gold fix. So I think, you know, so no, I, all these things are circumstantial. I don't think anything, I'm not saying it gives a, a very clear picture. I'm just trying to say, let's not all jump on the conspiracy or the, the manipulation bandwagon without at least considering some of the uh, mechanics of the market and, and that there could be alternative and mm, fairly innocent explanations. Well, per- perhaps. Um, I, I will note that uh, I was actually shocked myself to discover that a number of bankers had been colluding to influence, manipulate the LIBOR of all things. I mean, my goodness, there are trillions of dollars of contracts um, hinged upon that rate, and they had managed to maneuver that around for personal and private, uh, you, you know, well, institutional yeah, I know, I advantage. There's, a, there's an example. There's an example, as you say, of you know people will stretch the rule book to a limit. Uh, where there's a buck to be made, and uh, it's not. Um, I mean, I did see some headlines on LIBOR, and I know that there's a, a scandal on it, and it doesn't sound right at all. All right, Paul, we just got disconnected, but to pick up the conversation, then uh, we were talking about uh, how there are these uh, structural advantages and disadvantages in the market. We were talking about LIBOR and how even that uh, particular, it, it's a fairly, fairly significant and large. Um, uh, an important number in the world of finance, and in that case, the 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 price manipulation that had been happening. Of course, that's a sample survey, right? I, I, it may even be telephone calls, for all I know, go around to a number of member banks, a limited number, and they say, what are you paying? They average those out, that becomes LIBOR. Well, the numbers they'd been reporting had been um, placed in certain directions, which gave advantages to, to those institutions. So here's an example, uh, again, of just anything that can be done to uh, uh, create an advantage that people can use in the market to make a few more bucks for their institution, that's often attempted and tried. We're looking at the futures market before, noting that there's some structural advantages that might exist in that um, for the participants, particularly on the short side, if you have the ability to deliver. And it was Bart Chilton who said, I think there's, um, he says uh, two sentences here. I believe that there have been repeated attempts to influence prices in the silver markets. So he's not saying which direction there. There have been fraudulent efforts to persuade and deviously control that price. So to me, it's it's if people can control the price to an advantage that works in their benefit, they will do that. And I take that as an article of faith because I've seen it again and again and again. Now, in the futures market, People have another reason to be very concerned. Uh, when MF Global went down in flames doing things that, that frankly shocked me, I did not know that you could commingle client accounts and ship them out um, with the single email confirmation saying send a hundred million to, to these people. I did not know you could do that. There were farmers in there who had futures accounts on all sorts of grains. There were miners in there. There were people who actually had uh, physical numbered allocated bars held for them with a warehouse receipt in their account that discovered that when MF Global went down and the trustee came in and said, okay, we're going to try and figure out how to give everybody 72 cents on the dollar back for their troubles here, they took those numbered bars and sold them for cash, put the cash into a pool, and then the former owners of those bars got got uh, their 72 cents on the dollar for, for their troubles around that. Um, this is, you know, so I, what I'm t- speaking to here is that there is a um, a lack of faith now among a lot of people I talk to that the markets are free or fair, that that there's symmetry of information, that we're all playing by the same sets of rules. These are things that I think are legitimate concerns, given the, the couple of anecdotes I just reeled off there. Talking to this, how is it that that uh, bullion vault is different from from this crowd, or or do you think these concerns are overblown? No, I don't think those concerns are overblown at all. I think they're absolutely right. Um, the, uh, I don't know the detail that you clearly know about uh, MF Global. I've not looked at it in any great depth. It's one of the reasons Bullion Vault exists. Um, 
when I started buying gold 10 years ago, I wanted a long-term holding. I didn't want to own something through a business which was which was in the which existed primarily to uh, extend balance sheet risk. Um, futures broking, you are inherently exposed to counterparty risk. When you place property with a custodian, so you place it with a custodian, it is not a deposit. You sign a document which says this property remains yours, and you pay a fee to the custodian, which is very strong evidence that the property was never transferred. That's how we do it. So anyone, if there was a, if, if, if we went bust, we are incredibly financially strong, but if we went bust, or even if the, the custodian itself went bust, the documentation and the evidence of a payment for the fee of safekeeping makes it very clear that no liquidator could get anywhere near those gold bars. They are the property of bullion vault clients. Uh, that's different from a bank. That's different from putting security with a futures business. Uh, in both of those circumstances, you are placing something into the care of a futures or, or futures broker or a bank for the purposes of enabling transactions. And that is a transfer to the bank's or the futures broker's balance sheet. And that's probably why, I don't know the chapter and verse of the case with, with MF Global, but that is probably why the liquidator regarded that as the property of, of the company and the, uh, and the client who had placed that property there as a creditor of the business to be treated much the same as any other creditor. Nobody who owns Bullion Vault Gold is a creditor of either Bullion Vault or VMAP. They are owners of gold outright. Fantastic. I, I think, um, uh, yeah, in the case of the MF Global, I, I was referring to a Barron's article where they did note that um, certain traders uh, had already paid full price for the delivery of bars of gold or silver, and they held warehouse receipts to prove it. And uh, the one quote is, uh, that has investors fuming, quote, warehouse receipts like gold bars are our property, 100%. Contends John Rowe, a partner in BTR Trading, a Chicago's futures trading firm. So they had here's a company that had warehouse receipts. They were waiting for delivery of those, and those all got seized and tossed in. Um, it, it's again, I, I don't know if that was right or possible or what. It just speaks to a little bit of lawlessness that seems it, to happen. It is, yeah, and it's and it's an ugly way that some things can work out. The question is, you could pay for something in full and leave it there in support of your account in which case you've transferred ownership to the futures company. But, of course, nobody knows that when they do it um, and how the law will treat that. If, if the law does not find a clear document which says this property is under the safekeeping of the custodian and the fee is being paid, then there is a risk that that property will be grabbed by a liquidator in a liquidation. That's what you have to avoid. So you need to look at the documentation that makes it absolutely clear it is the property of you, the person who placed it under the care of the, of the company involved, and you want to make sure you pay that fee as well. It doesn't have to be a very big one. In the case of Bullion Vault, it's about a third of the price of an ETF. We charge uh, 12 basis points a year. But you have to have that fee because it's very important in the courts for showing that this is not a transfer of property to another organization in, in, in the nature of a business transaction, what it, what it shows is that the transaction, such as it was, was, a, uh, was placing into the custody of a safekeeper your own property. Now, without naming names, but if you can, please do, do these ETFs, uh, you mentioned they do have a custodial fee. Does that mean that they are um, uh, free and clear of this particular dynamic? No, um, I don't think it does. I think uh, you've, got to, you've got to look at the trust deeds in each case. What happens is the trust, as, as I understand most of these, uh, the trust owns the gold. You don't own gold. Nobody who owns an ETF owns gold. They own uh, a security which is backed by physical gold. Now, the major ETFs, I am, I'm, not, I'm not going to mention any names because I don't know them well enough, and I haven't studied the 300 pages of trust deed that would leave me comfortable. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but the, the, the major ETFs, I pretty strongly believe are backed to in excess of 99% by the gold that they say they have. Now, when I, when I say in excess to 99%, I think that in one or two of the trust deeds I've seen, there is a, an ability for them, so that they don't have to send a truck to and from the, um, the depositories every day, they can float a small amount of unallocated, but it's, it's, it's irrelevantly small. So um, my belief is that the major ETFs are, yeah, they're debt instruments. You don't own gold, but you own a debt instrument which is reliably backed by physical gold, which in 
um, the case of the major ones, the ones that people have studied in depth, that gold, I believe, is there. All right. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today. I guess in summary, uh, you still see the same basic tailwinds or structural supports for uh, the price of gold and silver going forward. We've got Italy and Spain haven't gone away, just been kicked down the road a bit, still to be dealt with. Uh, that overall, the markets do find their appropriate levels, that uh, if there is a certain um, price influencing that's going on in the markets, it's it's really a- around the margins by the participants who get to uh, uh, play a little bit of intraday games. And uh, that overall, yes, uh, there you have to be very careful these days, in, unfortunately, uh, really digging into some of the details around the precise holdings and legal framework in which your assets are held because this whole formerly quaint notion of what's you know what's on the piece of paper is mine is is uh, been proven false is that about right that's about right but what's on that piece of paper you know i always i always tell people you know when they look at their bank account um, they think they've got you know maybe fifty thousand dollars in the bank it says fifty thousand dollars cr credit you're a creditor Okay, it's the bank's property, that 50000 and they recognize in that document that they owe it to you. Uh, so, you know, you have to watch out for that word creditor. When you see CR, you're on the balance sheet, you're at risk. Very well said. Paul, thank you so much for your time. Okay, it's my pleasure. Bye. This concludes this podcast by Chris Martinson. To gain further insight into where things stand today and what might happen tomorrow, please visit chrismartinson.com. That's C H R I S M A R T E N S O N dot com. Please join Chris Martinson next time to continue your journey toward awareness, understanding, and action. The evidence for price manipulation appears to grow each month, but results in no real action on the behalf of regulators. No surprise there, of course. Add to this the more hawkish statements released by the Fed yesterday, plus Bernanke's recent trash talk tour against the gold standard. What's a precious metals investor to think? Paul, I'm glad you're joining us again to help make sense of all this. Uh, It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for asking me, Chris. Well, let's get right to it then. Um, What's happening with precious metals right now? Are we in a prolonged consolidation phase? I'm looking at my screen. I'm seeing a lot of red today uh, for both gold and silver at this exact moment. Uh, has there been a change in the fundamentals that we need to be aware of here, or is something else going on? Your views? No, I don't think there's been a, a great change in the fundamentals. I think we know pretty much what's going on. Uh, we have ongoing quantitative easing. It may or may not come again. The markets get bored of doom and gloom. People get bored of it. We had a belly full of it uh, over the back end of last year. Uh, certainly the economic data out of the U.S. is better than it was. Um, That's happening against a backdrop of still extremely loose monetary policy. So um, uh, we're in a world where, you know, the the Europeans have given an almighty kick um, of the can down the road, the one trillion euro reflation effectively of the European banking system. Um, That will come back to haunt us in a big way um, before long. They're all already starting to work. Welcome to Crash Concepts where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to another ChrisMartinson.com podcast. I am your host, of course, Chris Martinson, and today we have the pleasure of welcoming back to our program Paul Tustain, founder of Bullion Vault and editor of Galmarley.com. Paul is one of the foremost experts on precious metals, and I've invited him to share his latest perspective with us at a confusing time for investors. Gold and silver remain volatile, and they've been largely range-bound over the past year. Are you going to get about Spain? Um, Certainly in a year or 18 months, we'll have to have a long, hard look at Italy again. Uh, By then, it'll only be 18 months until all that money has to be paid back again. In the meantime, we're looking at a banking sector. It's got all the same problems as before, but markets do this. They have a certain rhythm. Um, uh, I I don't think the fundamentals have changed. I certainly don't think anything has been fixed. Um, Sometimes you have to be patient. Um, I'm probably of that school. I'm not looking at the charts every five minutes and worrying about whether the price is going up or down. For example, yesterday, and they're certainly quite thin markets. Ben Bernanke, it's the the publication of the minutes from... um, from the U.S. Fed, uh, which took the market sharply lower. Um, That's a symptom of a thin market more than anything else. Um, It's not an exciting story right now. 
Yeah, I noticed that uh, the Globex session seems to be a popular place, that thinly traded session in between uh, when New York Comics closes and we're waiting for other things to open up. You've just got that the e-mini market open for business. It's it's relatively thin. That seems to be a, a good place to see sharp moves like we saw yesterday after the Fed minutes were published there. Uh, and I will note, I just one thing I do have to um, raise here is that, you know, the U.S. is in relatively better shape, but only because the U.S. is deficit spending at a rate that we'd, we would excoriate Greece for attempting. And certainly Spain's feet are being held to the fire for for uh, running a, a rate of deficit that's far lower than the U.S. So, yeah, 